What's up, guys? It's the Blue Bloods, and we're coming at you with another episode in our ACC in 28 Days theme. We're joined by NC State Insider and editor of the Pack Pride on 247 Sports, Corey Smith. I just want to say I appreciate you joining me, man. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having me. For sure, for sure. So, you know, I want to kick this off. Um, this season, we saw the Wolf Pack. They went eight and three, but they fought the injury bug, especially with uh, the quarterback Devin Leary throughout the middle of the season. Did this season, in terms of your preseason expectations, exceed, meet, or fall short of your preseason expectations? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it, it exceeded the expectations. I think for a lot of NC State fans, the question after the year was, what if? Because there was a lot of injuries. Uh, there was a lot of you know, issues, which you know, everybody knows about the Devin Leary injury. But uh, you know, there was a lot of injuries to the offensive line. There was also a lot of injuries uh, in the secondary, which is the second straight year. They had a lot of injuries in the secondary, but they had some young guys step up. Uh, so I think in that way, it really exceeded expectations because I think for a lot of NC State fans, they went into the year going, oh, man, we're playing a, a mostly all-ACC schedule at this point. Like, you know, after going, I think it was uh, going, they won one game in ACC play the year before. They went 1-7 and went 4-8 eight, four and eight overall. Uh, so I think a lot of NC State fans were looking at that schedule going, man, if we get out of here, you know, five, what was it? I think it was 11 games. If we get out of here with a, a winning record, it'll be a great season. Uh, and then – you know, they, they continue to, to find ways to win a lot of close games, even after Devin Leary's injury. Uh, so I, I definitely think it exceeded expectations, but I think for a lot of NC State fans, after they saw what Devin Leary did against Pittsburgh, they, you know, suddenly the expectations were through the roof. They're like, oh, man, we can beat UNC now. We can beat, uh, you know, we can definitely beat Miami. And they came really, really close against Miami. So, uh, you know, I think if they had beaten Miami, there's a chance that NC State goes to the Orange Bowl this past year. Uh, so that definitely would have well exceeded expectations, not just, uh, not just you know, exceeded them a little bit. <laughs> right. I mean, and, you know, I'm glad you mentioned Devin Leary, too. I mean, he was so impressive through the first half of the season, and he broke his fibula in the Duke game, if I remember right. But how has his recovery been, and what do you expect from Leary in 2021 and moving forward? Yeah, it's funny. I actually just wrote a story about this earlier today uh yeah he's he's fully recovered from it uh the expectation after it happened was that he would have surgery and be available in six to eight weeks but you know in a pandemic year you had uh bailey hockman a guy that you felt comfortable enough with to win you games uh so they, they didn't rush him back they didn't want to risk any further injury and you know say he comes back and, and tweaks that ankle and has to have another surgery then he misses the start of, of spring camp uh, they get him back. He's fully healthy, fully ready to go at the start of spring camp. Uh, and he'll have, you know, several months to prepare and get back. Uh, but I think the expectation for him coming into this year is, you know, he's the guy now. I mean, I talked about Bailey Hockman earlier. Uh, Bailey is now transferred. He entered his name in the transfer portal. He's now at Middle Tennessee State. Uh, so he's he's left to go to a program where he can be a bona fide starter and, you know, probably not not, not have the expectations of, you know, he's just not Devin Leary. He's not the guy we saw. Uh, you know, he start, he actually started the Wake Forest game because of COVID-related uh, issues for Devin Leary. Uh, so he actually started, I believe it was eight games, or technically nine games if you include the bowl game last year. And that's how much they, they kind of relied on, on Bailey Hockman last year. So the expectation for Devin Leary coming into this year is to be the guy. You know, you, you want him to take the reins of the team. You want him to be the leader for this team. Uh, and, you know, after what we saw in those three games and, and what we've seen from him really taking his lump over the last two years, uh, that the expectation is he will he will meet that, uh, you know, heading into spring camp and, and be the guy. Because, you know, talking to a lot of NC State players, you know, kind of behind the scenes, they've said, hey, we're, you know, our expectation is for him to come in and, and you know, and take, the, take a, a huge leadership role for this team because they're, you know, they're really excited about his potential and, you know, especially after what he showed last year. Right. And I, I was really, really impressed with him. 
throughout the season. But, you know, you look back at two years ago when NC State finished, I believe it was four and eight. It was a real down season in terms of what the program's been experiencing. In, in your opinion, what was the biggest difference between this year's team and last year's teams? And what was, who were some players that really stepped up and made that difference? Yeah, you know, the biggest difference to me was the fact that they had, I mean, you know, that, that 2019 season, first of all, they, they had a, a ton of injuries. I mean, a ton of injuries. Like, I can't, even, I can't even remember going back to, you know, all the issues they had. But they obviously lost Ryan Finley the year before. They went through a quarterback battle. Matt McKay won quarterback battle in the offseason and did not live up to expectations at all uh, at the beginning of the year. They started off struggling from the very beginning. Then they lost a lot of players uh, along the offensive line. In the secondary, they had, you know, two, all, I think it was four of the top five cornerbacks that they had uh, in 2019. By week six, four of them were out. So that's, that's I mean, that's just the deck you were dealing with at that point already. Uh, and then, you know, they had some experience at the offensive line that year, but you know, not nearly, not really ready to be, you know, to step up in that role after losing so many guys from two years prior. Uh, so, you know, the 2019 season just was a lot of, you, know, you lost a lot of players to the draft the previous year. You also didn't have the quarterback of, you know, you didn't feel comfortable with your quarterback. Uh, Matt McKay was a starter for multiple games, and then Bailey Hoffman came in for two games, uh, didn't play well, won the series game, but had absolutely nothing to do with his play. Uh, and then, you know, you, you, they just said, "Hey, we're going to ride with Devin Leary. We're going to we're going to let Devin Leary start the rest of the games." And I think that valuable experience for him, for guys like Zonovan Knight, uh, for Ricky Person, for a lot of the young offensive linemen that they had, and for a lot of the young defensive players that they had on that year's team, getting that valuable experience really, really helped them uh, heading into the following year. And you saw it kind of come to fruition in 2020. Right. And I mean, like, like you said, I, I, I think if I remember right after that season, I tabbed NC State as the most injury riddled team I've ever seen. I mean, it just seemed like every week something else was happening. But I want to shift to recruiting. That's one of my favorite things to talk about. You work for 247. That's one of my favorite websites. I love getting on there looking at recruiting stuff. But National Signing Day wrapped up. And I don't think a lot of people realize NC State inked a top 35 class. I believe it was 34th overall on 247, loaded with a lot of players with huge upside. What players were the biggest priority for this staff? And did they really fill their the biggest holes for the future of this program? Yeah, you know, the biggest priority was making sure that you got another quarterback. Uh, they got that in Aaron McLaughlin, a guy out of Georgia that's a four-star recruit. Uh, they also got some really good wide receivers. They got a, a burner that they needed in Julian Gray, uh, who's a four-star wide receiver out of North Carolina. They also got uh, Micah Crowell, uh, who is, you know, considered one of the top uh, overall receivers, just a, a great possession receiver, has really good size, NFL bloodline. Uh, and then they went and got a, a couple offensive lines that they feel really good about, too. Uh, got one out of the state of Georgia, and then you got uh, Thornton Gentry out of the state of South Carolina. And then, again, you know, they stacked up on some North Carolina talent. I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of NC State fans, a lot of people within the ACC looked and said, you know, they, they, they lost out to North Carolina. North Carolina, you know, UNC went and got a ton of guys. Uh, but NC State really didn't. They filled a bunch of needs uh, with good players. Uh, and then, you know, they tried not to go too far outside of that box. They were trying not to, you know, just add talent to add talent. They wanted to add it at positions that they really needed for the future because that's how you end up guys in the transfer portal. That's how you end up with, you know, too much competition uh, and nobody wants to end up being there. Uh, so for NC State, they not only, they not only added a lot of talent because uh, they ended up signing 19 recruits. Usually you take 25. They saved a lot of scholarships. And they've already added five guys in the transfer portal. Uh, so they are actually four guys in the transfer portal. So they still have uh, two spots available that they can add more players. Uh, so I feel like they did fill some of their biggest needs for these upcoming years uh, that they really needed. But they also went out in the transfer portal and got some really good depth pieces uh, for the next uh, next year or two, actually, because guys like Corey Durden uh, from, from Florida State, a defensive tackle that comes to NC State that they're actually looking at potentially being a defensive end in the, the 
the three four system that they or the three actually the three three five system that they play. Uh, so they'll look to move him kind of inside outside. So they went to the transfer portal and got some guys they really did too. So this was a, a class fully built on needs for the future, but also needs for right now with some of the the transfer guys that they went and got too. Right. And, you know, looking at looking ahead is never too early, especially with early signing day. The Wolfpack have no commit yet in the 2022 class, but it's still very, very early. But what are some of the positions that are the highest priority of need right now? And who are the biggest targets on the staff's, I guess you could say, watch list right now? Uh, you know, in 2022, they haven't added anybody yet, like you said, but uh Usually they usually they kind of wait a little while, and I think part of the issue right now too, uh, when you talk 2022 class, uh, you know some teams across the country are able to, you know, they're they're just traditionally going to add guys like Ohio State, obviously Alabama, uh, you know Clemson, all getting off to, to good starts in 2022 class because, you know, kids, are, I mean, you can't turn away five star and, and top of the line four star talent. So if those guys are going to be willing to come, you you're going to say, hey, we got a spot open for you. Uh, for NC State, they're looking, again, at some of those needs, but they also have to figure out where they're going to be from a scholarship standpoint in the 2022 class because what they're running into right now and what a lot of teams across the country are running into uh, is the fact that they just don't – you just don't know what the scholarship count is going to look like because with the pandemic year, every player that you have on the roster has an extra year of eligibility. So as of right now, NC State has uh, 10 – 10 wide receivers that are considered true freshmen. Uh, they have, I believe, 12 offensive linemen. Or no, no, I take that back. 10 offensive linemen that are considered true freshmen. So, like you, those are those are always going to be some of your biggest needs that you want to add. And NC State, I believe, is still going to probably add one or two receivers. Uh, they really need to go out and get a running back. That's the biggest priority right now is finding a, a top of the line running back because. The feeling, at least around Raleigh, is that if, if Zodovan Knight has the kind of year that they're expecting to have, Sam Knight, as, as most people call him, uh, then he'll more than likely be looked at you know, going into the NFL draft after his junior year. Uh, so that's the biggest priority right now is finding a running back. They've got a guy, Michael Allen, uh, in, at Greenville Rose uh, in North Carolina that they're looking at really highly right now. He's a four-star kid. Uh, they're also looking at you know trying to figure out what they're going to do the quarterback position because they feel really good about where they are years in the future, but also for, you know, the, the guy that they just got in there, McLaughlin. Uh, and as I mentioned, they're looking at multiple offensive linemen. The defensive side of the ball, there's a lot of instant recruits uh, that they've been kind of going after. I can't really say – I would say Torn Wright uh, is a linebacker that NC State's really looking highly at. Uh, there's a few guys they've – you know, it, they haven't really reined it in quite yet. <laughs> And that's part of the issue right now is, like I said, they just don't know how many scholarships they have to give out right now because of the fact that as of right now, their scholarship limit is, is 85. They currently have 95 scholarship players on the roster. So that's, that's where they're trying to figure out what they're going to do for the 22 class. Uh, but you know, I, wanted, I wanted to kind of, before I leave that question, go back to uh, what I said about the 20, what we said about the 2021 class. You know, you mentioned the fact that NC State finished 34. You know, we talked to Barton Simmons before he left. Uh, he is actually with Vanderbilt now, our former uh, 24-7 director of recruiting. And, you know, he told us, he's like, if, if, we, if we put transfers in our ranking, if, if NC State's transfers not in the ranking, you know, with Corey Jordan being considered probably a four- or five-star guy, if you're talking about transfers, Cyrus Fagan, a former four-star uh, safety, uh, and then they add some of the top names in the, you know, the JUCO ranks, this class would have more than likely ended up in the top 25 if they had taken, you know, all 25 of their scholarships and used them. So that's where, that, you know, that's where things stand going into the upcoming year uh, and how well they were able to recruit this past year for the 2021 class. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, you know, I've always wondered that. I mean, the, the transfer portal is always is going to be so big. I've talked to people about that all the time. That it's not slowing down. It's just going to get bigger. So uh, I don't think that we weight those enough in the recruiting weight, in the recruiting rankings. But I want to shift to head coach Dave Doran. 
He was been at NC State for, I believe, eight years now after leading Northern Illinois to back-to-back MAC championships. What are the biggest traits you see that Doran exhibits that makes him almost the perfect head coach for the Wolfpack? And do you see him eventually leading this program to it into a, into an ACC championship or eventually winning it one day? Yeah, you know, that's kind of, I mean, I know it probably sounds crazy to some people that aren't in Raleigh and aren't really paying attention to the, the, you know, the structure of the roster or what they did this past year. Uh, but that's kind of their hope for this upcoming year is to compete. I mean, you know, they have opportunities to do it. You know, there's, there's going to be some tough games on the schedule. Uh, obviously, they start ACC play with Clemson. Uh, but this is a Clemson team that loses Trevor Lawrence. They lose Travis Etienne. Uh, they lose a lot of other playmakers along that offensive side of the ball. And they'll have some tests, obviously, early on. Uh, you know, they, their first game in ACC play will be against Georgia Tech the previous week. I believe they start the season against Georgia, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, you know, they'll be tested before they before they come to NC State and play uh, at NC State this year. Uh, but that's, that's your ACC over. And, you know, for NC State, they feel like, hey, if we're able to take off, if we're able to knock off Clemson this year, you know, they have other opportunities where they're going to have to play against, uh, you know, a team like Miami. They have to play against uh, UNC. Uh, that Miami game is going to be on the road, but UNC is going to be at home. Uh, the Like I said, the uh, you know, the Clemson game is at home. Uh, they feel like, you know, if they're able to, to knock off one, two, maybe, you know, all three of those opponents, then they're really, you know, in that ACC championship discussion. Uh, and, you know, at least in the discussion for a New Year's Six Bowl. So, I mean, while it seems like, you know, all these other ACC contenders have kind of, you know, gotten themselves locked in, uh, NC State feels good about where they are heading into the year to, you know, kind of be a dark horse in the ACC, even though, you know, as I mentioned, not a lot of national people are talking about it. Uh, that's, you know, that's what they feel like they've structured this roster towards. And if not, next year, uh, they feel really good about having Devin Leary again the following year, uh, having a lot of these playmakers back that we've, I haven't even talked about Emeka Emezi coming into this year being the lead guy. Uh, a lot of young players in this roster with Porter Rook, Adam and Mike Crow up coming in. Uh, you know, they feel really good about a lot of these playmakers that they have for the following year, too, in 2022 as well. Right, and I mean, you mentioned some of the biggest players on the roster and Leary and Zika, all the, all those guys, but sticking with this upcoming season, who are some players on each side of the ball that – that are prime for a breakout season this in 2021. Yeah, well, one guy that I just mentioned, Porter Rooks, uh, at the wide receiver position, he's the guy that, you know, it came in this past year, was expected to be the, you know, expected to be kind of, you know, the, maybe the sixth or seventh wide receiver. Uh, and I believe he finished fifth on the team in overall, or maybe fourth on the team in overall yards. Uh, the one of the reasons why didn't end up having the breakout season that he that he you know maybe some might have seen for him was because of the fact that Kerry Angeline at the tight end position, uh, you know they didn't really go to two slot wide receivers or four four wide receiver sets a lot, but going into this year they don't have a you know a guaranteed guy that you're going to be looking at at the uh, you know at the tight end spot, so they might be going to more two slot wide receiver sets. Uh, and using just a tight end as a blocker this upcoming year. So if they do that, then he's a guy that, you know, Thayer Thomas has been playing really well, uh, you know, for NC State over the years. But Porter Rooks has, has really good speed, uh, also has, you know, really good hands. Uh, the one, the one it's funny to say that because the one touchdown chance that he had this past year uh, was a look like a catch against Virginia. Uh, but they ended up calling it a drop after the review. They called it a touchdown, then called it a drop, even though it did look like it moved very much. But uh, you know, he has he has a chance to be a really good player this upcoming year on the offensive side of the ball. And then on defense, you know, I mentioned Corey Jordan. Uh, you know, he essentially took a year off this past year after coming from Florida State. Uh, so he's he's being looked at as a guy that has breakout potential. Uh, but another guy that you know that not a lot of people knew about this past year was C.J. Clark, uh, that defensive tackle spot. Uh, Ali McNeil is the only only starter that leaves that defense. Uh, he entered the NFL draft this year, and so he's he's a guy that you know is potentially a, a day two pick uh, coming into the NFL draft. That's just three. 
years at NC State. Uh, D.J. Clark played his redshirt freshman season this past year and actually got some starts over Lynn McNeil. Uh, that's how talented he is. So they lose a really good player in Lynn McNeil, but we're going to see what T.J. Clark is capable of doing. He is a, a former four-star player just like Lynn McNeil was uh, in the 2019 class. So after two years with NC State, he'll still be a redshirt freshman next year because of the COVID year, uh, and he has a chance to be a really good breakout player this upcoming year. I like it. I like. It. I'm gonna be paying attention to, the, the, to those those few guys. But you know, looking way ahead, you have a you guys have a trip to Starkville against Mississippi State this year. You guys have BYU, Texas Tech, Cincinnati, Notre Dame in terms of out of conference games that are on NC State schedule. Looking forward, how important is this for the recruiting impact for NC State and getting this program out in front of these recruits that might not ever have a chance to see NC State play in person? Yeah, you know, it it kind of – I said this a little while back on one of our podcasts. It reminds me a lot of NC State's 2017 schedule. That was a year where they had Bradley Chubb. They had, uh, you know, Ryan Finley in his second year. They had Kelvin Harmon, Jacoby Myers. They had Garrett Bradbury at center. Uh, They had their entire front line on the defensive line all ended up going to the NFL draft that next year and all were – picks inside of the top five rounds uh, with Bradley Chubb being the lead guy. I say all of this to say that 2017 season, they ended up finishing nine and four. They finished eight and four in the regular season. And a big part of that was because they played a non-conference schedule that included South Carolina, which was a loss and Notre Dame, which was a loss. Uh, So two of those games you lose, and then you still finish six and two in the ACC where you finished eight and four overall. So, that, you know, that to me, this is another opportunity for NC State to, as you mentioned, not only, you know, help yourself from a recruiting standpoint and be looked at as, you know, a potentially national name if you beat Mississippi State, if you beat USF, uh, which USF is a team that's probably a little more down this year, but uh, still, you get those wins um, and it puts you into, you know, it puts you into some other living rooms that you might have missed out on before playing against a Florida team and playing against an SEC team. So, that's where you know that's where you hope to be able to get those wins is to help in recruiting, but you also have to look at it from an overall season standpoint of we can't miss these opportunities. If you want to consider yourself as one of the top teams in the ACC and you want to get to you know say you finish seven and one in the ACC but you still finish nine and three overall because you lost two games in the non-conference schedule, one to you know Mississippi State and one to you know another out of conference team, then you know you see the season as as not a great overall season because you, you had too many slip-ups. So uh, the, the hope is to be able to finish strong in the ACC, but they have to do that first by, you know, winning all four of those games in non-conference play because if you get to – you want to get to a 10 – uh, you know, a double-digit win season still finish, you know, not be able to win all of the games in ACC play where you got to go 4-0 in non-conference. And, you know, that, that game against uh, Mississippi State in Starkville is a huge opportunity for them to – to really set the bar at the beginning of the season. Right. And, you know, just two last questions here. The first one is about the ACC in general. I really am interested in this because, you know, I'm from Alabama. As you see in the background, I got Auburn stuff. I mean, the SEC perception is kind of skewed, in my opinion. Even as an Auburn fan, I think SEC gets a lot of, of, like, almost too much credit at times. Why do you think the ACC doesn't get its respect? I mean, it just there's always this narrative that it's Clemson versus everybody, and I don't think that's the case. Miami, North Carolina, NC State, Virginia Tech, all these programs have, I think, the, they're primed to really break out and be on this national landscape and compete for national championships. Why do you think the ACC seems to always get the short end of the stick in that regard? I mean, one of the biggest reasons is because they just don't, they don't thrive on those opportunities. You know, when you, when you talk about the ACC this past year and in the bowl schedule, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of ACC teams, NC State included, lost to some SEC teams in those opportunities you had. You know, a lot of these beginning-of-the-season games, they lose to the teams, and a lot of people just go, you know, they, they get back up. And for the ACC to be able to, you know, to say it's more than just Clemson, they have to be able to win the games against the out-of-conference teams, like, like NC State and Mississippi State. You know, Mississippi State is not considered to be one of the top teams in the ACC this, or SEC this upcoming year. You have to be able to win that game. Say 
hey, we wouldn't be a bottom we would bottom beater in the SEC. Well, if you lose that game and then Mississippi State has a losing record in the SEC, guess what? Everybody thinks you're going to be a bottom beater in the SEC. So you have to be able to win those games. But you also have to be a beat Clemson. I mean, that's the that's the biggest issue for for the SEC or the ACC right now is you're just not beating Clemson. And the only team that's beaten Clemson was a team that the ACC, you know, Notre Dame this past year that's not even really an ACC team, and they did it when you know Clemson was playing without Trevor Lawrence. So this is you know this is the year for the ACC to say, hey, Clemson is a is a really good team. They're a powerhouse program, but you know, if the ACC is going to say that it's not just Clemson this year, somebody has to knock them off because this is the one year where you can say, you know, Clemson is not the Clemson that you've gotten used to. They don't have all the powerhouse, have all of their playmakers. Uh, they have two seasons, three seasons, uh, and now you can say, hey, you know, one of these ACC teams can step up and and be that team. Then now you're looking at the ACC as more of a an entire conference as opposed to just Clemson. Right. And, you know, I, I like I like that perspective. I think Florida State not being the team that they once were hurts a lot. Miami was down for a few years. So there's a lot of factors there. But, you know, last question here. I love asking this question to people. But what makes NC State, Raleigh, Carter-Finley Stadium one of the best environments in the ACC? Yeah, honestly, it's the fan base. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's funny because talking heads, you know, in the in national media love to kind of poke the bear with NC State because they know how pissy this fan base can get. <laughs> and that's just the truth. Like, so you know, on, on the basketball side, you know, Cole Kubelek likes to do it uh, on the football side every once in a while. Not really poke the bear, but kind of, you call NC State so that a lot of people around the you know around the SEC will question like, dude, you got to stop talking about NC State. And you know he loves the offensive line that NC State puts out there every single year because he was a former offensive lineman. So uh, he likes to be able to kind of pump them up. But you know, the, the fan base at NC State, not only are they loud, but they're vicious. You know they <laughs> they're just hateful, like for for no particular reason. And I say that in a, in a very loving way, like just to get under the skin of coaches, it gets under the skin of players, uh, whether it's on football, basketball, whatever it is. Uh, but, you know, it's also, you know, from a recruiting point, it's the city of Raleigh. Like, I think a lot of people are surprised when you come to Raleigh how big of a city it is now. It's not New York City. It's not L.A. It's not Miami. Like, I'm not trying to put it at or Atlanta or anything like that. But it's a big city, and it has a lot of opportunities. I mean, it's seen as the number two overall uh, you know, city to live in in the entire world uh, based on several polls last year. I think it's some of the places in Australia that was, uh, that was rated number one. But, you know, in terms of opportunities, in terms of places to live and places to thrive, Raleigh in the Durham area has been rated as number one uh, in North America for several years now. So, you know, that's, the, that's what they're selling to recruits is not just a football standpoint, but, you know, the opportunity to get in this area to – you know, to come here and make the home too, uh, for, you know, they always talk about the 40 year decision that, that plays a lot into it, uh, and the education you're going to get, but also the, you know, what you get from the standpoint of, you know, from playing in the ADC, but also, uh, you know, the city that you're living in. But yeah, when it comes to Carter Finley, it's the fan base, you know, it's not as, it's not as big of a stadium as some of the ADC and, you know, some of the, you know, like Michigan or Ohio State like that, but, you know, when you when you talk about the fan base and you talk about Carter Finley, like when it comes to the ACC, I've heard over the years for several years, like from UNC players and from Clemson players, saying that it's one of the tough places to play, not because of how loud it is, but just because of how mean and how vicious some of the fans can be. <laughs> Uh, I like it. I want to get up there for a game very, very soon. But man, I definitely appreciate you joining me on here. All to, to talk all things NC State football, but I'm gonna give you a chance. Plug plug the website, plug your Twitter, anything you want to plug, any shows you do. So I'll give you a chance to do that now. Yeah, the best place to find us as you know, packpride.com, uh, part of the 24/7 Sports Network, uh, and then you know on Twitter we're at Pride. Uh, my personal uh, Twitter handle is at r Corey Smith, and it's C O R Y, so it's at. R C O R Y S I D H. 
Uh, you can find me there. You can find me on Twitter, on Instagram. And when it comes to Pack Pride, it's it's all over everything. You know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, you know, we don't have a TikTok. We'll be creating one of those. Uh, probably not in the future. Facebook is like an absolute need. Uh, but yeah, our podcast, you can find us, uh, Pack Pride, when you search on Spotify, on uh, you know, Apple, on uh, Google Play Store, things like that. So uh, that's the easiest way to find us, just searching Pack Pride. Two, two words, yeah. not one. Yeah, guys, definitely go check it out. Um, good stuff on there. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to the season, man. Uh, hopefully we can have you on this season when NC State gets rolling. But we definitely, definitely appreciate it. But, guys, that is a wrap on this interview. We will continue our ACC in 28 days scene later this week. But you guys know where to find us. But for right now, guys, we are out.